I'm Femi O.K. and you're in the stream. Research shows that exposure to reading material early in a child's life has both an immediate and long-term effect on their vocabulary, general knowledge and comprehension skills. I'm Malika Bilal. Studies have also shown that non-white children who see their own identities and experiences reflected have higher self-esteem, better social-emotional functioning and increased classroom engagement. So then why is it that there's such a dearth of children's books that include diverse characters with diverse attributes. This infograph summarizes where things are in the US and numbers are improving, but hardly where they should be. Today, meet three authors who are changing that. As always, this conversation is for you in our community. Growing up, did you see book characters that reflected your life? So many of you have already shared your thoughts and there's much to talk about. So join our conversation live on YouTube or message us at AJ Stream or Twitter on Twitter or Instagram. That's what Robin Thomas did when she pitched this show. When you're raising your kids in an environment where their religion is not the predominant religion, um, it can be difficult when you don't see stories that reflect your family um, or that kind of tell your stories. Um, so it's kind of what led me to write Rami the Ramadan Cat. So I think going forward, um, <clears throat> We need uh, more agents who are willing to take a chance on authors who have Muslim characters in their stories or are telling Muslim stories. And joining us now from Los Angeles, California, Matthew A. Cherry is the author and filmmaker of Hair Love. His film was just shortlisted for the 2020 Oscars. Congratulations. Welcome to the stream. So good to have you here. So, yeah, no, thank you so much for having me. I wanted to start right away online because that is where there is so much buzz for your work. I want to share this tweet circulating online. This is January the Hamster. That's her handle. January says, like so many others, I contributed to the Kickstarter for Hair Love. Looks like my first foray into the world of arts fundraising on the web has paid off mightily. A terrific film and critical acclaim. So on this show, we're talking about books, but this is a book that came from a film. Talk to us about yep. the inspiration. Yeah, you know, a couple of years ago, um, I was coming across all, a lot of these videos of uh, dads doing their daughter's hair, and it just really seemed like a great opportunity to kind of hit representation on a couple of different fronts. You know, uh, black fathers often get one of the worst raps in mainstream media about being not present and being deadbe deadbeats, et cetera. Then also, you know, young girls, they rarely see themselves. You know, I think there's so much kind of policing that's going on with black hair nowadays. Like you saw the situation with Gabrielle Union and America's Got Talent, how they were mad at her because she changed her hairstyles too much. Other stories of kids uh, being discriminated against when they try to wear their hair uh, naturally in school. So, you know, I think for us, it was just really kind of an opportunity to really just show representation on a couple of different fronts and kind of showcase a uh, black family in a way that, you know, really hasn't been showcased before. So, Matthew, the original idea was to make an animated short film. Let me show people on the Kickstarter page because I just dug it up recently. Yeah. Just see what the reaction was. So scrolling down here, the pictures are beautiful. Yeah. That must have been half the attraction. But you were looking yeah. for 75,000. That's not yeah. bad for an animation <laughs> film. Look how much you got. People were literally yeah. throwing money at you. <laughs> take my money, take my money. And let me show you just a little clip of what Hair Love actually looks like. Hair Love the animation, because then there became Hair Love the book. Let's take a look at the animation. Yep. See? Now, wasn't that easy? <laughs> it does a little bit. Uh, it does. And yeah. I actually want to pick up on that because we got a tweet from uh, Honey Child who says, I love the movie and I think it resonates with a lot of people of color. I am native and the movie really promotes the idea of beauty as ourselves, not as how, quote unquote, white culture defines it. So in this uh, short and of course also in the book, there are lots of layers and there are lots of types of beauty. The dad has locks similar to yours. Mm -hmm. The mother uh, is wearing a headscarf. Talk to us yep. about that. 
Yeah, you know, again, you know, I think uh, it was just really trying to um, touch as many um, inclusive hairstyles as we could. Um, you know, there, uh, not to spoil it for anybody, but, you know, there's a scene towards the end of the short film, which is a little different than it is in the book, you know, where the mother, um, you know, doesn't have hair anymore. And we just re also really wanted to show that, um, you know, regardless if you have hair, you don't have hair, and regardless of what your hairstyle looks like, you know, you're, you're still beautiful. And, you know, Zuri still sees her mom as a queen. So, yeah, man, just try to get as much in there as we could. Matthew, people obviously wanted this. They, they threw money at you. They supported the Kickstarter. <laughs> and then uh, your publishing story is ridiculous. It's not like, I, I yeah. searched around for a publisher. <laughs> what happened? Yeah, so um, we, we launched our Kickstarter, you know, two years ago. And uh, what ended up happening is um, we offered a, a children's book as part of the Kickstarter, mm -hmm. not really knowing how we were going to do it. We just kind of being forward thinking and um, like, you know, if it works out, we can try to figure it out. And what ended up happening was uh, this really amazing editor who worked at Penguin Random House, uh, Namrata Tripathi, uh, reached out to us uh, in the middle of our Kickstarter campaign, like a week into it, and basically asked if we were um, had a partner for the book yet. Uh, she thought what we were doing was really special, and I wanted to be a part. And while there were a couple other offers that came in, ultimately we decided to go with them because, uh -huh. you know, they got it from the jump. And we're really just fans, even when it was in this Kickstarter form. So, yeah, and then we came out in May. So, of course, there are lots of good reactions to it. I want to share this from Susie, who says, as a parent, a grandparent, an educator, or one who celebrates diversity, I feel it's important for all kids to see themselves in children's lit. More books are needed to represent our nation of diverse learners without stereotyping or misrepresentation, which I, I think your, your work does uh, that very well. Matthew, what are people telling you about it when they see it, when they see the book, when they see the film? It's been amazing, you know, like, there have been some stories, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of parents kind of saying like they wish that they had a book like this growing up, you know, kind of it's crazy now when you go into certain bookstores, you see like whole kind of sections that are dev devoted to kind of African-American picture books, you know, Matthew. Bashi Harris and our great. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Matthew, I, I, I want to show people how little girls react to your book. Is that OK? OK. Because yeah, there's been some, some very memorable yeah. moments. So this okay. is what happens when little girls look at this book. Some of them look at Hair Love. Uh, let's take a look. Look! That's me! That's you? It looks just like you, huh? Look at that ponytail. so much fun. <laughs> She's yelling out, it's me, it's me, yep. looking at the little girl in the book. She's obviously loving it. How does that make you feel? It's really a dream come true. You know, I think with art, you know, you put it out into the world and you hope that it has that type of impact. But just to see, like, young girls um, being able to see themselves in it and literally say, like, that's me, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's priceless, you know. And I hope mm. that it, hope, hopefully it helps to change um, people's confidence around their hair and hopefully they'll embrace it more. I think it's doing just that. Matthew, thank you so much for joining us today. Congratulations again on the Oscar shortlist. We'll be cheering you on from the stream. Bye-bye. When I was growing up as an Indian immigrant daughter in the U.S., I never saw anyone who looked like me in the books that I was reading or the TV shows and films that I was watching. And so when I wrote my Bengali folktale and string theory inspired fantasy series, Kiran Mala and the Kingdom Beyond, starring a 12 year old intergalactic demon slaying Indian immigrant daughter from New Jersey, I wrote these books for the 12 year old that I had been who had never seen myself. And I wrote these books for my own children and for all our children in response to Toni Morrison's famous call. If there's a book you want to read and it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. Oh my goodness, I'm sure that story must resonate with Saoja Joshi with her publishing house Barat Babies. She's looking to change South Asian representation in children's books. Saoja, thanks for joining us. The idea of you setting up a publishing house, where did you get that idea? Because it's not easy. <laughs> it's, it's not easy at all. And thank you so much for having me. So the journey to creating Barat Babies really started um, my own journey to motherhood. I was pregnant with my daughter and I was having this library themed baby shower as you do in the age of Pinterest. 
And I really wanted to put books on our bookshelf that reflected my own culture, my history, my heritage. And what I found out there was really problematic. You know, there were books out there, but some of them were developmentally inappropriate. Some of them were culturally inaccurate or worse, culturally insensitive. And I couldn't believe that in this day and age, my daughter wasn't going to see herself on the cover of the book. So it took leaving my PhD program and $1,000 of startup capital, <laughs> but that's how Barth Babies was launched. We have a tweet here that is perfect for you because this is Ivan Ash who says, there aren't enough platforms that allow people of color to write stories in their own way. Publishing houses expect writers to write in a manner that they want, not that the writers want. He who has the money has the power to dictate what he wants. And I'll add in she as well. But talk to us about what this tweet makes you feel and, and, and if this was some of the thinking behind why you started it. Yeah, I think... I truly wanted to create a platform where South Asian, the South Asian experience could be seen and heard and created. And that's why it ended up being a publishing house. You know, I tried writing a book and, you know, maybe one day there will be a book that I write. But for some reason, it, it wasn't what was going to happen. And so instead, I decided to launch this publishing house because I realized just how important it was to give a platform to others and to give a platform to this entire community. Sajo, you were saying that you couldn't find the right books for the family that you were starting. I'm just scooting through some of the books in your publishing house. We have Finding Om coming out next May. Padmini is yeah. powerful. Always Anjali. Sala in the Sky. We have an art series as well. Can you tell us one story that, that shows what to be culturally sensitive, to be culturally aware actually means? Oh, that's, it's a really, really great question. And I think each one of our books does a really phenomenal job of sharing that South Asian experience because we recognize that the South Asian experience isn't unified. It's multidimensional. You know, you have South Asians who are Muslim, who are Hindu, who are Christian, who are Sikh. And we want to share all of that. I think there are a lot of books in our platform that do that really, really well. Wow. Let's Celebrate Diwali is one of our sort of perennial favorites that really shares how Diwali is a multi-faith holiday. And that's a story that's not often told in mainstream media. Also, I think Super Sapya Saves the Day is a really phenomenal story because like right there on the cover, you have this multicultural family. You know, you have a dad wearing his turban. You have his daughter who's proudly Sikh with her long, long hair on the cover. And it's really just an opportunity for those of us who have so many different backgrounds, who have all those different intersections to see ourselves. So we're uh, hearing from people who are watching this live, and as you're speaking there and talking about the challenges you face, I want to bring this in from Milky Way on YouTube, who says, the question is whether these diverse heroes will gain acceptance by public schools curriculum. And I'll, I'll add in bookstores and bookshops across the country and internationally. Talk to us about that challenge. How do you make that happen? Yeah, so I am a, a small, independent publishing house in a sea of big five publishers who own and operate this business. So getting seen and heard is hard. It's really, really hard because we don't have the same budgets as these big publishing houses do. We don't have the same resources as these same publishing houses do, but we continue to do it. And we do it with grassroots campaigns, boots on the ground, really focusing our efforts in getting our books into the hands of the people who want them the most. You know, I think our 1001 Diverse Book Campaign is really our attempt to make sure that children in some of the most um, stricken areas that don't have access to these books will get access to these books. And so it's partnering with schools one after another to make sure that they have our books in their bookshelves and that we're able to get the, our books into the hands of their kids in their classrooms. Tell us about the feedback that you've got so far. Man, the feedback is amazing. And I think I went into this really naive. I thought I was just going to, you know, maybe publish one or two books a year. It would be fun. My friends would buy it. And the response has been phenomenal. We've won awards. We've been featured on mainstream TV. And all of that is great to get that industry recognition. But what really, really um, sort of makes this all worth it is when little kids come to my booths, you know, when we do these events. 
and they hear and see these stories and they see themselves and, you know, they run away with the book because they just are so excited to have seen themselves on the cover of a book. And you know, usually their parents are mortified because they're kind of shoplifting. Yeah. But it's just this wonderful, <laughs> tender moment. I, I, they see themselves. So I just want to show everybody the, the picture, the, the Twitter profile picture for Barat Babies. It's at Barat Babies, so you can find it. But the little girl's smile when she's looking at pictures of herself, representation matters. I think that says so much about what you're trying to do. So Thank that's you. actually my daughter. I knew, I knew it. I knew there was some family <laughs> relation there. Um, uh, I hope she gave you some, some very reasonable rates there for you as you took her picture. Thank you very much, Salja, for joining us here Thank on you. the stream. Take care. There is very low reading culture in Ethiopia, which means children don't have access to books that are culturally relevant and fun. So since we started publishing in 2014, we've produced over 250 titles in seven different languages of Ethiopia. So our aim is to teach children how to read and also help them fall in love with reading. For us, uh, this means producing books that are culturally relevant, that, that has characters that looks like them, that talks about their challenges, that talks about their history. So my hope is children who grew up reading our books will grow up loving who they are and being proud of who they are. Well, joining us on set now is Nina Harufe. She's author of I'm a Princess Too, and along with Robin, who you saw earlier, she also pitched us this show. Welcome, Nina, to the stream. So good to have you here. Thank you for having me. So I want to share some of the buzz about your book, which I have here. Everyone can see it um, online because there is buzz. So this is buzz from high places. Dean Abdullah, who's also been on our show before, comedian here in the US, says, my friend Nina wrote a great new book. It's called I'm a Princess Too. And it's about a young Muslim girl who wears a hijab and is just trying to live a normal life. Buy it and support her. Where did the idea for this come from? So the idea came from growing up and never seeing myself in any, in any form of media, not in books, not in TV, not in movies. And it was very frustrating. There's a severe lack of diversity that I think was prevalent when I was growing up and it still is, even though the needle is shifting, it's still where not where. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Cliffside Park, New Jersey. Um, but growing up, I loved the arts, I loved acting, I loved drama club, and but I never saw myself represented anywhere and it was always upsetting to me. And I caught myself complaining a lot about how we were never represented and no one cared about hijabis and hijabis are chopped liver. But then I realized that I should help change the narrative instead of just complaining about it. So I took action and I wrote this book to try and help little girls read it and see themselves in a, in a children's book. Nina, I'm just looking at your Instagram account and this is, this is so beautiful. Here's you perched on a bench, uh, reading allegedly your book. <laughs> looking at the likes though, over 3,000 likes, the support was definitely there, yeah. which means that you are now a role model. Are you comfortable with taking that on? I'm not comfortable taking on the role model. No, I am. Um, it's a lot of pressure, but um, it's pressure that I think I can handle. Mm -hmm. I think little girls all over the place, Muslim, non-Muslim, black, the black community, Latinx children, anybody should grow up and just be who they are. Mm -hmm. And the fact that there isn't any type of representation or there isn't enough representation is really sad. Um, so if I could help, shift things, I'd love to be a role model. I want to share this experience from Sumaya Toba, who has worked with the stream before. Sumaya says, my kindergarten teacher gifted me a book called The Egyptian Cinderella when she heard we were moving to Cairo. Unfortunately, it was about a blue-eyed, blonde-haired Greek slave girl living in ancient Egypt, but I guess it's the thought that counts. So even then, you have someone trying to do something good because, you know, they think this book will help represent you, but then it doesn't. So oh, man. In, oh, my God. In, in your book, you actually dedicate it to two... Two people. Who are they and why? Yes, I dedicated this book to my nieces, Fatma and Aya, because they're mini-me's and they always say they want to grow up and be like me. They say they want to be comedians. I don't think they're going to be comedians, but so I, <laughs> I, hope, I, know, I, I, hope I hope they don't go down my road. <laughs> Top off. <laughs> you know, and that's a problem with diversity. There is a difference between diversity and inclusion. And diversity sometimes isn't always sincere. So it's kind of like, here's someone who looks like you, shut up and stop complaining. Mm -hmm. But inclusion is when they invite us to the table to help make the decisions. And more often than not, that doesn't happen. So that way, that's why it was so important for me to write this book so I could make sure that I control the narrative. Because you know, things like that happen. Mm -hmm. 
uh, definitely kudos to you. Congratulations to you for, for deciding, I am going to change the narrative, yeah. literally, on writing the book. But you couldn't do it unless you found a publisher. That's really important, that connecting and going maybe mainstream or getting out of uh, a very small niche so that everybody can read what you're writing. How did you do that? I was very fortunate. I found a great publication company. Um, I just did some research, basic Google searching, and the first person I found, I set up a phone conference, and I pitched my book idea, and he loved it, and he took it right away. Um, one of my old friends from high school um, drew all the pictures, and it was in print within a couple months. It was a very quick turnover. I'm very this lucky and fortunate. It's a ridiculously happy story. Yeah, it's, I wish I had a more touching story of how it was so I'm, hard for me, but it really wasn't. You might need to work on your backstory a bit. <laughs> it was, I had a great publisher, and he said yeah. that he saw the benefit of diversity in children's books, and he said that we really needed it, because if you look at some of the stats from last year, less than 5% of books were published for the Latin community. Less than 10% were for the African American community. Muslims didn't even make the polls because it was so little. Mm -hmm. And then you have over 30% of books were had animal protagonists. Like more books were made about animals than all the minorities combined. So I think I was very lucky where I found the publisher who understood the struggle and was totally on board with it. So I want to share this uh, a tweet from Earth Dog on Twitter who says, I think it's important for children and teenagers to read about and see people like themselves, but just as a natural part of the story without everything being heavy handedly about race or gender. So in this case, I might add in religion. Do you feel like that is a criticism that some might have of this? Like, why are you forcing hijab and Muslims down our throats? No, I think my story is about a young girl named Amina and She's just a girl going to school who auditions for the school play and gets bullied because a bunch of girls tell her that she can't be a princess because she doesn't have long blonde hair. The twist in my story is she really doesn't get affected by the bullying. She goes home, she practices, she works hard, she lands the audition and gets the role. So it's not even about her being Muslim and her fighting her identity. She knows who she are. She's, she, she knows who she is. She's comfortable with who she is. She works really hard and she gets what she wants. It's not about forcing a slam down anybody's throat. It's just a book about bullying. And it could be about any type of bullying, really. Anybody could relate to this. It seems ridiculous that we're having this conversation in 2019, almost 2020, going into a new decade. Why do you think we are still talking about inclusion, representation matters? I just think the needle is moving because I think it's better than it was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's moving very slowly. And I also think because not enough of us are doing things like this. Mm -hmm. I think the Muslim community really needs to step it up. And I was very inspired by Tyler Perry's speech. He said, don't fight for a seat at the table, create the table. And I think the Muslim community really needs to do that. And I think we are doing that. There's shows like Anami Out, which I'm a huge fan of. Mm -hmm. There's books, there's movies coming out. I think we are headed in the right direction. I just think, I hope it was a little bit quicker. Mm -hmm. So Aisha here on Twitter says, I work in a school and daily see how the lack of representational books in the curriculum and in mainstream lit impacts children. Children feel excluded and undervalued as if their voices and experiences aren't of importance. So one small story from her there, but as we wrap up here, are there any plans to get this into schools uh, and, and part, as part of the curriculum? Yeah, it's already been picked up by a couple schools. They want me to come and read it to the class. Uh, my nieces brought it to school, their teachers read it to their class. It's it's been such an amazing turnover. I'm really happy that, because my nieces go to public schools mm -hmm. and they're really taking my book seriously and they're teaching children about diversity. And I just feel like diversity is so important because looking up to somebody and relating to them on a physical level helps with self-esteem, helps with identity, helps shape society and just helps things move along quicker. Nina, we are out of time, but a big thank you to you and all of our other guests. So many new books to add to our shelves that we couldn't let you all go without sharing two more from authors from our community. Have a look and we'll see you next time. When I was writing my books, I didn't feel that the media was representing my family, a multiracial family, a multicultural family. So I decided to write one for myself that had images that looked like my family that talked about my kind of culture. I wear a bonnet to bed every night and when I started my daughter on the tradition that my mommy started me on, I was shocked that there wasn't a book or a resource for us to read together and enjoy this. So 
my advice is if you see a void that you think needs to be filled, go ahead and fill it. Because when I went to Random House and explained this ubiquitous black tradition and how important it is and how great a book would be on it, the first thing they said was, oh my gosh, that sounds like a great idea. 